Okay, so it's uh, 1031, so let's uh, get going here again. Um, so we're talking about this place-kicking place example, and we're talking about how to estimate the probability of success as a function of distance. And so what I like to do next is look at the situation or, or look at a plot of that. And this is motivated by what you will often do with a normal linear regression model where you have x on your x-axis, where x is an explanatory variable. You get y on the y-axis, y is your response. And typically you do some kind of scatter plot of the data and you draw the linear regression model, which should be straight, right through the, the middle of those points. Okay? I want to do the what will be essentially the equivalent then with respect to um, um, uh, logistic regression. Let me just check something right here. Okay. Was, for some reason I couldn't remember if I hit record or not. <laughs> um, and rather than doing a scatter plot of the data, we're actually going to do a bubble plot of the data first. Um, and to do that, what I want to be able to do is I have about, uh, and I haven't mentioned this before, I have about 1,400 observations. And I want to condense those over unique combinations of the distances. I'm sorry, not unique combinations of distance, but each unique distance. In other words, instead of having a Bernoulli format of the data where every observation is one place kick, I want to change it so that I have basically a binomial form of the data where I have the number of successes out of the number of trials at a particular distance out of these 1,400 observations. And to do that, I'm going to use a function R called aggregate. Again, aggregate means I'm going to combine over stuff. So what I want to do is I want to combine over good. I want to summarize over the good variable for each unique distance. My data is in place kick again. And how do I want to summarize? I want to sum up all the ones and the zeros that are in good. So that will give me the number of successes at each unique distance. I'm going to put that into W. Now I need to know the number of trials or number of observations total for each unique distance. And so I use aggregate again, but now I change the function to length. And length is going to count the number of observations per unique distance. I put that all nicely into a data frame. I find then the, the proportion of successes observed for each unique distance. And using the head function, I'm able to do a brief a summary of what that data looks like, the first six observations. And so, for example, at distance, 18 yards, there were two successes out of three trials. So there was one miss, uh, that poor place kicker. Uh, and so if you do the proportion of successes, two divided by three, you get 0.67. At 20 yards, you have 776 successes out of 789 trials, and you get 0.67. 9834, I'm sorry, 9835 as the proportion of successes. So this was, again, the data was collected back in 1995. Does anyone know why there's just so many more observations at 20 yards rather than some of these other distances that you see there? It's because of point after touchdown. So in football, and I didn't mention this before, there are actually two types of place kicks. There's a field goal, which we saw an example of already, which is worth three points if successful. There's also a point after touchdown, which is worth one point. And typically, these are, or at least they used to be, done at just 20 yards. So we have a lot of information there um, at 20 yards. And this will come into play later on, especially when uh, Tom does, uh, does um, some stuff uh, this afternoon. So what I'd like to be able to do then is plot distance on my x-axis the proportion of successes on my y-axis. And this will give me a, essentially a scatter plot of my data. And the way I'm going to do that, um, since there's a lot of code involved, this is a place where I say, okay, I'm, I'm just not going to show it all here. It is in the program, though. Um, and I'm going to use the symbols function to do the bubble plot part. And you'll see why it's a bubble coming up. And then I use a curve function to actually plot the estimated logistic regression model on top of it. So this is what the plot looks like. So again, we have the estimated probability of success 
pi hat, or the observed proportion of successes for a particular distance on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have distance. And if we take a look at these bubbles, these circles that are different sizes there, this is my observed proportion. So at a distance of 18 yards, remember we had two out of three successes. And so that's what's represented by this bubble there. Now, the size of that plotting point is proportional to the number of trials at a particular distance. So notice that plotting point is relatively small. Excuse me, because we only have three trials. Take a look at this big circle here. That corresponds to those 20 yard place kicks that we just saw, the 789 of them, I think. That's why that circle's so big. Okay. We'll come back to why I decided to draw the points like this very shortly. My estimated logistic regression model. Yeah, I guess I have it in the in the legend already. Uh, is denoted by the red line. So you can see as the distance increases, the estimated probability of success goes down. So for example, if I were to attempt a very long place kick at 60 yards, the estimated probability of success is about, oh, about 0.27, not very high. Now also what I've done here is I've put 95% confidence interval bands on the plot. So what I did was I was able to use the predict function at every single possible distance you could say, essentially, um, and then plot the corresponding interval. So at 60 yards, the, I'm 95% confident that the probability of success is somewhere between 0.19 and about, mm, about 0.32 relative to that y-axis there. Now, these are individual confidence intervals. Um, I'm not tr controlling the family-wise confidence level here at all, but you could do those too. Now, when you look at a plot like this, in, in terms of like, like uh, regular old linear regression, again, here's a scatter plot, here's my x, here's my y, I have my line there, and if I had a point that was way far off from the line, what would you think about that point? It, well, it, it leverage, yeah, or it's just not fit well because of the distance it is from the line. Um, well, that's a, that's the way you would approach it from a a, a simple linear reg or uh, so, well, yeah, simple linear regression sense. What do you think about the fit of this model? Look at those points there. Kind of far from the line. But am I concerned about the fit of this model? Actually, no. Or not, not too much. There, there will be one little small problem later that, that Tom will talk about. Uh, but these points don't concern me. Because remember, these points are drawn in a size that is proportional to the number of observations. We have essentially binary responses. So if you only observe one trial at a particular distance, what are your choices for the proportion of successes? Zero or one. So you have to be very careful then when looking at this plot and not interpret it exactly the same way that you would do with a, with a linear regression. That, you know, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some, you could say. And, um, you know, you're going to have a success or a failure. That's it. So I'm not concerned here because those points are really small. They're representing a small number of observations. I mean, in fact, even this one here, I'm not really concerned about because it's only three observations. You know, I mean, if you miss one, immediately you're far from that red line there. Now, what I would be concerned about is if I had a large circle, let's say, down here or maybe a large circle up there because that represents I have a lot of information there, but yet the model is not fitting well. Now, this right now, what I'm demonstrating, is kind of an ad hoc way to assess the fit of your model. It's a good place to start. Tom will look at more formal methods later on. But whenever I only have one explanatory variable, I always look, start looking at a plot like this before I do more formal methods. Okay. Any questions?
Well, I, would, I wouldn't call them outliers. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't call them outliers because, again, it's a binary response. See, yes, these, these could be important people, yes. But, you know, in terms of evaluating the fit of the model, you know, in this particular case, when you only have one observation, either you are going to be down here or you're going to be up there, you have no choice. And so what you could do and what some um, measures of, uh, more formal measures of, of goodness of fit, let's say, do is what they'll do is maybe combine some observations that maybe fall, fall in there and look at those combination of observations, their proportion of successes, and look how they compare to that red line, not the individual observations when there's only one or, or, or just a few. Okay? this exact example when I talk about goodness of fit of models. So I, I understand your line of questioning. See if you still have it once we've talked about <laughs> that particular problem. The thing is, uh, this Oops. is uh, theoretically pleasing, but again, when it comes to reality, it may not be that, that powerful in terms of the prediction uh, explanation. What? If you want to get to it later, that's fine. I'm just wondering, you know, you can combine those observations and how are you going to uh, I'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, uh, I mean, logistic regression has been uh, many, many years, right? I mean, we need to think one step further, over and beyond what this traditional customer level of level of techniques. That's, that's a much bigger discussion than what we <laughs> I would say very common use. Uh, yes. Well, you know, I don't. Uh, you don't see prediction intervals used uh, with respect to this because you know we're we're modeling the expected value of y, and if you wanted a prediction interval, basically you would because binary responses. There's your interval. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I understand. You know, in a normal linear regression context, that's typically what's done, but you wouldn't see that in this kind of a categorical data context. Okay, so let's uh, now talk about um, different ways to have explanatory variables in our model. So, for example, we might want to look at a situation where we have an interaction term. Well. And this is handled the same way as you would with a, a normal, regular, old linear regression model. But I want to focus, though, on what happens then with our interpretation of that interaction. OK, so let's consider a, a logistic regression model where we have two explanatory variables. And notice we have an interaction term here as well, x1 times x2. And of course, with an interaction, what that means is the effect of x1 on the response. It depends upon the level of x2, and vice versa. Well, what happens to our odds ratio then? So, again, what an odds ratio is, is simply take one odds, divide it by another. And we're going to focus on the odds ratio for x1. We're going to look at a C unit increase in x1 in the numerator, and just x1 in the denominator. And look what, we, what happens here. The beta zeros disappear. Beta 1 times x1 disappears. Beta 2 times x2 disappears. And also a beta 3 times x1 times x2 disappears as well. And what you're left with is e to the beta 1 times c plus beta 3 times cx2. In this uh, odds ratio, notice that x1 is no longer there, just like what we had previously. But now we have to worry about this additional term. 
And that makes sense, because what this odds ratio is doing is looking at the relationship between x1 and the response. But when you have an interaction, you have to worry about, well, what level are we at with respect to x2? So the interpretation for this odds ratio is the odds of success change by uh, the OR times for every C unit increase in x1 when x2 is, let's say, held constant at a particular value. To get R to estimate these kinds of models with GLM, we can use the formula argument again. And there are three different ways that we can write out the interaction. The first way is we say Y tilde X1 plus X2, as you might expect. And then to do the interaction, use X1 colon X2. A second way, a little bit more compact, is you use X1 asterisk X2. That doesn't mean you're just taking X1 times X2 and that's it. What R recognizes this as is that you want the, what are referred to as the main effects, x1 and x2, and the interaction. And then lastly, we could also use parentheses x1 plus x2, caret sign 2. That caret sign 2 does not mean I'm taking it to, a, I'm not squaring it. Rather, what that means is I want x1, I want x2, and I want the interaction as well. So you have to be very careful about that. So in a more complex, uh, I guess a little bit more complex setting, suppose you have x1, x2, and x3. So you have three explanatory variables. If I did caret sign 2 there, that would mean I want the x1, x2, and x3 main effects. But also I want all pairwise or two-way interactions as well. If I change that to a caret sign 3, that means also I want the three-way interaction between them. So you have to be very careful about the syntax. Well, what about some other kind of transformation of your explanatory variable, such as a quadratic term? So suppose I have a logistic regression model where I have x, and I have x squared in it. What happens to my odds ratio then? Well, again, our odds ratio is the ratio of two odds. So I look at the odds at x plus c divided by the odds at x. Again, I have some simplifications that occur. The beta zeros disappear. The beta 1 times x disappears. This beta 2 times x2 is going to disappear if I uh, times this out. It's going to cross out with that x squared there. And so what I'm left with then is e to the beta 1 times c plus beta 2 times 2xc plus c squared. Now this is the first time though that we've seen with this odds ratio that I'm doing odds ratio corresponding to x, but x doesn't disappear. You still have that in there. So then, therefore, there, your interpretation is going to be a little bit more complicated. The odds of success are OR times as large for when X is at whatever number plus C, then for X at whatever number. So with respect to, like, the place-kicking data set, the odds ratio, let's say if I want to compare a 20 to a 30-yard field goal, I would need to actually put in there, let's say, 30 and 20. If I want to do 40 to 30, then I have to actually put in there 40 to 30 because x doesn't disappear from this expression. How do I get r to estimate these models? Again, in the GLM function, we use the formula argument. And uh, we can say y, if you, y is your response, tilde x plus. And to get that square term in there, I s use the i function, i x caret sign 2. So what the i function stands for is um, um, Is it identity? For some reason, I'm, I'm blanking. Something like that. It's, it, it's a bizarre definition. Yeah, it is a bizarre oh, definition. That's a good way to put it. Uh, I, think it's the, I think it's called the identity function. I forget what the, if, if that is the exact name. But all this does, it, it tells our, hey, that caret sign 2 is not what you meant, at least on our previous slide. I'm not dealing with interaction terms. All that it means is that I want to treat it like it should be. It's a square. That's what, how I want you to treat it. Okay? Interpret? Okay. Thank you. Um, what about categorical explanatory variable? Um, well, 
you know, we represent categorical explanatory variables in a regular old normal linear regression model. Uh, let's say if I have, let's say, a Q level explanatory variable, um, then I use Q minus one indicator variables to represent it. So, for example, in a logistic regression context, let's suppose I have a four level explanatory variable named CAP, for the lack of a better name. It has levels of A, B, C, and D to it. And the way that I represent that in my model is to create three indicator variables and to represent it. And this is the actual coding that R would use, where with these three indicator variables, X1 corresponds to the B level. So X1 is equal to 1 if you observe level B, 0 otherwise. X2 is corresponding to level C, 0 otherwise, and X3 corresponds to level D. Notice that level A has X1, X2, X3 all equal to 0. And by doing this, by only having three indicator variables, I still have a unique representation of all four levels of the explanatory variable in my model. Now, the way that R does its coding here, or I might, get, I might be getting ahead of myself, but yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll explain how R does its coding shortly. Now, what, what about an odds ratio in this context? So let's say that I you know, when we did these odds ratios, we had two levels of our explanatory variable and we compared them through a ratio. Well, suppose I want to compare the odds at level B of my cat explanatory variable, and I want to compare it to level A. Well, what happens to that odds ratio? Well, again, for X1, for le when you're at level B, you're at a value of 1. For X2, you're at a value of 0. and X3, you're at a value of 0 as well. For odds of A, of course, you're at values of 0 for each. So in the end, only that B1 remains. And so you're at E to the beta 1. That's the odds ratio comparing level B to level A. What sometimes people will do in terms of the uh, misinterpreting this is that they'll say, this is the odds comparing level B to all the other levels. But that's not the case. It's comparing just to level A because that's where all the X's were equal to 0. How about, though, you want to compare, let's say, uh, the odds ratio comparing uh, level B to level C? Well, again, X1 is equal to 1, 0 for all the other values for, uh, due to, because you're at level B. X2 is equal to 1 for a level of C. And so now you have a contrast, E to the beta 1 minus beta 2, as your odds ratio comparing level B to level C. How do I get this to work in R? Well, if you have this categorical explanatory variable, all you have to do is put cat in the formula argument, and R will automatically create these indicator variables for you. And what I was trying to get to a little bit earlier, unfortunately, was that how does R decide how these indicator variables are formed? Because there's actually other formulations for these indicator variables. Like if you're familiar with SAS, what SAS will do is actually let level D be all zeros, and A would re be represented by X1, B would be represented by X2, C would be represented by X3. Instead, what um, R does is sets always the first level of your explanatory variable that's categorical in nature to the all zeros, where in terms of levels, R puts everything in alphabetical order in terms of your levels. So A, B, C, and D. If instead you had, let's say, a lowercase a and an uppercase a, the lowercase a would come first in terms of how R orders everything. If you were to also have some numbers with your levels of your categorical explanatory variable for some reason, the numbers would come first in numerical order. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. This involves uh, a, a consulting problem that Tom worked on a few years ago, uh, corresponding to the control of the tomato spotted wilt virus. And to give you some background associated with this, I have a short video uh, that talks about the tomato spotted wilt virus. This video comes from a TV show that we have back in Nebraska called The Backyard Farmer. It is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. It is the longest locally produced TV show 
uh, in the United States. And then the last disease we commonly see in tomatoes is a viral disease, and that's tomato spotted wilt virus. Once we get that fruit development setting on, the fruit, instead of being that nice red color that we're after, it's going to be blotchy. We're going to have blotches of red, yellow, and oranges on that fruit. You can still eat the fruit. It's no impact to you. But the virus can move from one tomato to the next and when we have thrips present. So we usually recommend removal of those infected plants and look at thrips using sticky traps to determine if an insecticide application is actually necessary to control the insects in your garden. Okay, because uh, the speakers are pointed away from me, I can't hear it very well. I hope you were able to hear. The, 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 the basic idea is they were talking about thrips. Thrips are, are insects, and they spread the virus from one plant to the next. Now, for a, a further emphasis of just how important this might, the, the tomato spotted wilt virus is, I was going to actually bring a tomato from my garden here today uh, to show you what it actually looks like in person when a, when a tomato has it, but I was afraid what would happen if I put the tomato in my luggage and, you know, it might not survive very well. And so, have tomato sauce. That's right. Okay. So, this experiment that, um, that Tom worked on, uh, there were 16 greenhouses involved with it. And each greenhouse would had 100 uninfected tomato plants. Then the researcher wanted to introduce the virus into the greenhouse in one of two different ways. One way was to add infected tomato plants to the greenhouse and also release some uninfected thrips into the greenhouse. So, you know, eventually these thrips would feed on the infected tomato plants and then, you know, spread it to the other plants. Then the, the second way um, where the virus was introduced, and, you know, these two ways were not done in the same greenhouse. Uh, the second way that, that it could be introduced was to release actually infected thrips. Okay? This is a categorical explanatory variable. It has two levels, and they're numerically coded, level one, level two. Also, to now control the spread of viruses to the plants, there was three different ways that were investigated. Each way was applied to one, uh, was applied to each, to, to one greenhouse. So, uh, con um, the variable in the data set is called control. And control level B uh, is a biological control, basically through predatory spider mites. So hopefully these spider mites eat the thrips. Uh, the second way was through using, uh, was a chemical control, or level C, uh, that uh, was through basically applying a pesticide. And uh, the last way was actually no control overall. So it's a nice thing that we can compare to, which would be, uh, so I'm going to uh, denote this as N for none. And what we actually observe is a little bit something slightly different from what we saw with the place kicking data set, where we had a Bernoulli, or just a, a binary response. Now we're going to actually observe the number of tomato plants displaying symptoms in a greenhouse after eight weeks. So we're, we're observing a binomial response. We're observing a count. So at most, 100 plants could be infected. Uh, the lowest number could be zero plants infected. So we're going to observe a binomial response. So my data is in tomatovirus.csv, a common delimited file. If I use the head function to look at the first six observations, this is what we have. So with infest method equal to one, I use a chemical control. There were 100 plants in there, um, and 21 came down with the virus. With uh, infest method number two, control was uh, chemical control again, 10 of the 100 plants came down with the virus. Now again, we have two explanatory variables here, and they're all, they're both categorical in nature. To explore this further, what I can do is examine the control variable of tomato, and I can examine it using a function called class. So I want to make sure that R is recognizing, hey, this is a categorical explanatory variable, or what you could say is a factor. And in fact, R comes back to me and says, yeah, this is a factor. So that's good. 
And next, I can use the levels function in R to check, well, how is R going to order everything with that categorical explanatory variable? And as we said before, it does an alphabetical ordering. And lastly, I can use the contrast function to see how R would create indicator variables corresponding to these levels of the explanatory variable. And remember what R does, it sets the first level to all zeros, so that would be B. And then it's going to, since we have three levels of this categorical explanatory variable, it's going to create two indicator variables. One for C, that would be like our X1, and one for N, that would be like our X2. Okay. Now let's take a look at the infest variable. Now infest is actually coded numerically with levels one and two, but it is actually a categorical explanatory variable. So when I say class with it, it comes back integer. I like to be able to change that to a categorical explanatory variable. So what I can do is I can use a function in R called factor. So if I say factor with the infest, then what I like to do is basically put this transform variable back in my data set. I could have created a new variable in the data set. Instead, what I did was I just simply wrote over the previous variable. And now when I do class with the infest variable, yes, R is using it, recognizing it correctly as a factor. And when I do the contrast function with it, you can see how it's going to create the indicator variable. Level two is going to be the value of one. So let's take a look at how we can estimate a logistic regression model in this context. So I'm going to use the GLM function, and there's going to be two changes from what we've done before. First, in my formula argument, since I have a binomial response, I need to put the number, the count for the number of plants that come down with the virus divided by the number of trials. So you could say, W divided by N if you wanted to. So virus 8 is the number of plants that come down with the virus divided by the number of plants. Then after that, it's the usual syntax. Tilde, my variable infest, my variable control, but also I want to include the interaction between infest and control as well. Family equal binomial, link equal legit, data is in tomato, and here's the second change. I'm going to use the weights argument to tell R this is how many plants I have per row of my data set. Is there a question? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, you need a, a, at least, well, you would need two times three or six to have all possible combinations. So I think some, uh, obviously, some uh, treatment combinations are replicated. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, you know. There was unequal replication. That's okay. all. I didn't design the study. <laughs> I don't know. You probably didn't design it either. I probably, probably didn't design it either. Came to you. probably showed up in my yeah. office the, the week after the paper got rejected. <laughs> um, so, so then I put all the results into mod.fit.enter for the lack of a better uh, name uh, as a place to save this. And I summarize it. And so this is what we get for then the, uh, the estimates of our beta. So here's beta hat 0, uh, beta hat 1 is that coefficient for the, uh, for the first indicator variable uh, representing infest, or the only indicator variable representing inf infest. Then beta hat 2 is the indicator variable representing level C of the control variable. Now, the way that R then tells you in the output which variable or, or which parameter you're talking about or which uh, actual explanatory variable you're talking about, notice what it does here. It says control C, control N. That tells you, okay, this is the indicator variable 
where n is equal to 1 when you're at level n, 0 otherwise. Similarly, infest 2 corresponds to you're at level 2 of infest, um, and that's when you have a level of, uh, or value of 1, 0 otherwise. Then in the output 2, to, to represent then the, the interactions, notice how R then forms all pairwise interactions between these categorical variables, and it says like infest 2 colon control C, infest 2 colon control N. Now, using all these beta hats, then, we can write out the estimated logistic regression model, um, as, as I show there. Uh, now, with this particular setting, you might be interested in, let's say, doing a hypothesis test. Like, is that interaction important or not? So, we can set up our hypotheses, where the null hypothesis is no interaction. The alternative hypothesis is an interaction. We can apply the capital ANOVA function, like what we've done before, and this is what we get. If I look at the infest colon control row, my negative 2 log lambda is 28.2. My p-value is very small. So yes, there's a significant interaction there. Now let's look at odds ratios so that we can understand better the relationship between the explanatory variables and the response. So I've just reproduced this estimated logistic regression model again just to remind us uh, what it looks like. And what I like to do is focus on the control variable. And since I have an, uh, since I have a, um, an interaction, I need to set the other indicator, I'm sorry, set the other explanatory variable to a particular level. So I need to fix it. So I need to fix the infest at either a level 1 or a level 2. So, or, yeah. And what I like to be able to do is compare first level N for no control to level B for a biological control. And remember, biological was that set all level equal to zero uh, um, uh, for our indicator variables. So the odds here with respect to level N, so the odds of becoming infected essentially with the disease for level N, and I'm going to fix infest 2 to be equal to zero. So that means you're at level, um, level um, in the infest method number one. And to find what then the odds are for that particular case, I need to look back in my model. And while this is the estimated model, uh, we, we can do this. So the odds then correspond to, so infest 2 is equal to 0. So this means that we're going to lose that. We're going to lose that. We're going to lose that because infest 2 is equal to 0. Also, I'm at level N of control, so I lose control C. So that in the end, I just need the intercept, and I need beta 3 that corresponds to control N. That's my odds of coming down with the virus. Now for the biological control, in that particular case, all my indicator variables are going to be at zero. So I lose that one too. And I'm left with just that intercept term. So that in the end, e to the beta 3 is my odds comparing level n to level b when I'm using the second infestation method. Well, what about comparing level n to b when you use, I'm sorry, that, this was using the first infestation method, excuse me, which means fs2 is equal to 0. It can be confusing. Um, now, <coughs> excuse me, what about infest 2 equal to 1? So this is now the second infestation method. Now what I have to worry about is infest 2, because that's going to have a value of 1 in my, uh, for, for the indicator variable. So control C is going to be a 0 again. So this one's going to go out. But control N is going to be a 1. Infest 2 is going to be a 1. Control N is going to be a 1. And infest 2 is going to be a 1. So now I have to worry about beta 0, beta 1, beta 3, and beta 5. Also, then with respect to 
the biological control as well. Just remove that one there. Um, and also that one there because now control n is equal to zero. And I'm left with beta zero and beta one. So again, if you, if you go through the, uh, the math here, you get e to the beta three plus beta five. That's my odds ratio for comparing level n to b with using the second infestation method. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of other combinations that you want to look at too, but um, we don't have time to go through them all. But on the next screen, I do have a list of them all, you could say, um, where I'm going to set up a way to use the MC profile function so that I can do profile likelihood ratio intervals. Now, whenever you have more than one beta that you're concerned about, you can't use confident anymore to do the profile likelihood ratio interval. You can only use the MC profile package to do it. Because again, what MC Profile does, it allows you to find confidence intervals for linear combinations of your betas. And that's what we have here. Remember that beta 3 plus beta 5. So to do this then, previously we formed a K vector. Now I'm going to form a K matrix where every row of that matrix is like one of these vectors that I was interested in. So if you remember, the, the first odds ratio on the previous slide was E to the beta 3. So I need to basically, in my first row of my K matrix, set up my coefficients on the betas so that I get just beta 3 itself. So, and I've nicely labeled everything. So I've just put zeros everywhere except for where you have a beta 3. Now for the second odds ratio, I need E to the beta 3 plus beta 5. So I set up my matrix so I have a one for the beta 3 and a one for the beta 5. Now to construct this matrix, you can use the matrix function in R. And in my program itself, it's the code for the matrix function is written out a lot nicer. It's just um, in order to do my uh, slides here using the Beamer package um, uh, that's associated with Lix and LaTeX, and also using the knitter package, which allows me to embed my R code and output into a LaTeX document. Um, unfortunately, it formats this, this, formats this rather poorly. But the way that you would see in my actual program itself is that I have one line of code, or I have a line of code for K, and basically I, uh, let's see now, I stop right here, then I go down to the next line, and I write out, the next row that would be in my K matrix and so on. It's a, it's a lot prettier, trust me. <laughs> um, also, some things I've done here that's different from before is I use a by row equal true argument here. And the reason being is because by default, R will put all these zeros and ones into your matrix by columns. I want to actually do it by rows. It's just easier to see. And also I use a dim names argument here, similar to what we saw with the array function, that allows me to put in the row labels and the column labels. Okay, so that's my K matrix. Now it's just a matter of going to the MC profile package again. So I say, hey, I want to use it. And then I use MC profile function to calculate a whole bunch of negative two log lambdas for every single row of my K matrix. And then I can use the confidence function to find my confidence intervals for every, uh, essentially, uh, every, well, k times beta, you could say. Um, and one thing that I'm doing different here is that adjust argument. If you remember before, I had just equal none. Well, what adjust does, it allows you to control the family-wise confidence level. So there are two different ways to do the family-wise confidence level in uh, this confident function. There's a Bonferroni procedure, and there's single step, which is uh, similar to using Tukey's uh, student ties uh, range. Um, and I'm using single step here. If I put none, then each of the intervals itself will be 95% intervals, but the overall family-wise confidence level will not be controlled. I'm controlling it here. I put all the results into ci.log.ss, and then I use the exponential function with it so that I have now confidence zeros not for the linear combination of the betas, but instead for the odds ratios. Like, so this, for example, is the 
corresponding confidence interval for e to the beta 3 plus beta 5. This is the confidence interval for e to the beta 3. And so we see with this very first confidence interval that the odds ratio is all above 1. You remember, we're looking at the, the odds of coming down with the virus, given that you're at level N, versus the odds of coming down with the virus, given you're at level B. So what this is saying is that it's more likely, the odds are higher to come down with the virus if you use no control versus a biological control. The confidence interval does not contain one. So we've shown that that biological control is helpful. Okay, so these logistic regression models that we talk about come from a family of models that you probably have all heard about called generalized linear models. There are other ways or other members of that family that can be used with binary responses. In particular, what are called probit models and complementary log-log models, which are, 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 are the most, um, most known, I should say. And, but logistic regression models are typically the most used. And the reason comes down to what we saw with those odds ratios. So everything's nicely set up to, for interpretation purposes. And so I'm just going to skip through that. Um, and so, so you're going to see logistic regression models that use throughout science um, or, or various applications uh, because of this odds ratio thing. And you don't see probit regression as much as maybe once in the past. Um, and very rarely will you ever see complementary log log models. Okay, so that concludes then section three. I just want to double check to see how I am on time here. Okay, now I'm right on time. Cool. Are there any questions? Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to section four. So now we're going to talk about analyzing a multi-category response. So we've been focusing on um, binary response, success or failure. But what happens if you have more than two categories to your response? So for example, maybe uh, you give a survey to some people and one of the questions on the survey uh, has a response that is a five point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Well, how can you handle that situation? That's what we're going to be talking about. Now this particular kind of uh, multi-category response has five levels to it and it's also ordinal in nature. And when you see something like that, you might be thinking, well, is there some way that we can take advantage of that ordinality? And yes, there is. And we'll talk about what's called a proportional odds regression model that allows you to take that into account. Now, in other settings, so for example, uh, what's been done at times with drug discovery experiments, you might have um, more than one kind of response, such as it's a positive that, uh, that drug might be helpful to, to examine, or it might be a blocker, or it might be neither. So now you have three categories, and they're not necessarily ordinal in nature. You could say maybe a nominal response. In that particular case, then, you know, you, you don't have an ordinality to take into account, and you, but you still want to model it. And so we're going to look at what are called multinomial regression models to do that. And, you know, there's many other multi-category responses out there. So, for example, Canadian political party affiliations at the federal level will be uh, one of them. So, in this section, we're going to let Y denote our categorical response variable. And it's going to have levels 1, 2, 3, all the way up to category capital J. And we're going to be very interested in the probability that Y is equal to some category, little j, let's say. We're going to denote that as pi sub little j. Now, in our setting, we will assume that every item or every person in our sample fits in one and only one category. So what that means is that the sum of these pi's is equal to one. There are other settings out there where you might have, let's say, a choose all that apply kind of variable on a survey, uh, where that doesn't happen. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about that, we actually talk about that in uh, uh, chapter six of our book, but unfortunately we, do, we don't have time to talk about that here. So let's look at a simple situation where we have n identical trials with responses y1, y2, the yn. Maybe you're giving a survey to someone 
um, or some people, end people, and you're interested in, you know, what, what is the response from category 1 to, through category J. And what you could do is, is that you could aggregate or summarize all their responses so that you have counts. How many people chose, chose response level 1? How many people chose response level 2? And so on. And when you do that, then, you're able to uh, appeal to a nice probability structure a multinomial distribution. Now, in this multinomial distribution, you see pi sub j right in there. Again, the probability that you respond to with category j. This is what we're going to be interested in. This is what we're going to be trying to model. And what we're going to do is set this pi sub j equal to some kind of linear combination of regression parameters and explanatory variables, just like what we did with logistic regression. It's just a little bit more complicated because we have multi-categories. So now let's talk about a nominal response uh, multi-category regression model, meaning that the, the categories have no ordering uh, among them. And so we're going to have, again, J categories with corresponding probabilities pi 1 through pi sub J. And now we're going to go back to using odds again. So previously, in the previous section, we, you know, we had the odds of a success. Okay? And that was equal to pi times 1 minus, I'm sorry, pi divided by 1 minus pi. Probability of success divided by probability of failure. And in fact, if you want to be really formal, you can say that this was the odds of a success relative to a failure. We didn't have to make that, we didn't have to make that distinguishing um, uh, extra part there because we knew we only had two possible responses, success or failure. But now when you have maybe more than two, you do have to say what you're relative to. So in our case, we're going to observe category J or relative to category J prime. So just a, a nice way to say maybe category two versus category one category 3 versus category 2, and so on. And the odds, then, is pi sub j divided by pi sub j prime. Now, you know, when you have, you know, you know uh, a significant number of, of these categories, you might be thinking, oh, there's going to be a lot of odds that you're going to have to worry about. But in the end, you only need to worry about capital J minus 1 of those categories. Because once you have capital J minus 1, you can figure out what the other co comparisons, other odds ratio, other odds, I should say, will be. Well, I mean, all, all are, you're, in your odds ratios, now, now you're going to have to specifically state what the odds that you're, you're, you're taking in your ratio. Yes. Okay. So let's take a look at a simple example here to show that you only need capital J minus 1. And let's say that capital J is equal to 3. And I'm going to set J prime to be equal to 1. This is just easy to do. And let's suppose we have already found the odds for category 2 relative to category 1, the odds of category 3 relative to category 1. Well, what about category 3 relative to category 2? Well, that's easy to find. How about you just take the ratio of the two things that you do know, the pi 1's disappear, and you have the odds of category 3 relative to category 2. That's why we only need capital J minus 1 of these odds. And this is so important because now what we're going to do is relate J minus 1 of log odds to explanatory variables. So now we're going to have log odds of category J relative to category 1 is set equal to a linear combination of your regression parameters and your explanatory variables. It looks very similar to what we had with logistic regression. In fact, if capital J was equal to 2, you would have logistic regression back. Notice the, the, the differences here. Each of these betas have a J on it. And notice the J right here as well. So this model here is going to have capital J minus 1 simple, simply equations, you could say. Because you're going to need to do this for J, little j equal 2 up to capital J. 
This model is referred to as a multinomial regression model. Some people will refer to this, uh, refer to this as a baseline category logit model. The reason being is because Notice, at least in the initial model formulation, we're comparing everything to one, you could say, baseline category, category one. So in this particular setup, you might be wondering, well, okay, this is nice to know the log odds, but what about just the probability itself, the probability that you, you have category J? Well, so what is pi of J relative to this model structure? Well, let's go back to what the odds of a response J relative to, uh, I'm sorry, the odds of, of having category J relative to category one would be. And so I took simply the model that we had on the previous slide. We had a log on the left side. I basically moved it over to the right side using the exponential function transformation. So now I have my odds written in terms of my model. And I can come up with a general expression for pi sub J itself. So I have pi sub j is equal to, just move that pi 1 over there, pi 1 times e to that linear combination of the, of the parameters and the, and, and the regression parameters and explanatory variables. But I don't want that pi 1 there. I want this just on the right side to only be concerning the betas and the x's. So remember that these pi's have to add up to 1 because you're in 1 and only one category. So what I can do is write this, this sum out in terms of my model. So there's pi 2, there's pi sub j, and notice what each of these expressions inside this sum have in common, pi 1. So let's factor it out, do a little math, and now I have a nice expression for what pi 1 is just in terms of the betas and the x's. Once I have that then, I can get all the other pi's. Just plug in that pi 1 right up there. And now I have a way to get all the other pi's. Now, why is this important? Well, because we want to do maximum likelihood estimation. Remember that multinomial distribution that I showed you a few slides before? That multinomial is going to play a, the, a huge role then in our likelihood. Because what our likelihood function is going to be is a product of a bunch of multinomial distributions. One for every observation that you have. And simply in that multinomial distribution, you're going to put what your model is in terms of those pi's. Again, you're going to need to use numerical iterative methods then to find what values of the betas maximize that likelihood function. Let's take a look at an example of where we can do that. So this example deals with wheat kernels. This was a um, consulting problem that Tom and I worked, at, worked on a number of years ago. And a grain science researcher um, came to us and said that he wanted to develop a, an automated way to determine the quality of wheat kernels, where the quality had three different levels to it healthy, meaning, hey, this is going to produce some good, good wheat flour for us. Sprout, meaning that the kernel has already sprouted. And then lastly, a level called scab, which meant, oh, the kernel came from a plant that has a disease. And in fact, uh, this actually um, uh, can actually be poisonous uh, to humans. And so uh, this is... Uh, I guess picture some wheat kernels there. If you see some like white chalky ones, those are the ones that have uh, the scab. Okay. And so he wanted to develop an automated way so that humans didn't have to actually look at the kernels to determine the one of the three categories. And um, his method allowed automated measurements of the density, hardness, size, weight, and moisture content of the wheat kernels. Also, he gave us information about, is this wheat kernel from hard red winter wheat or soft red winter wheat? So we had a categorical explanatory variable as well. Then through human visual inspection of the 275 kernels that he had to work with, he was able to decide, well, is this a healthy kernel? Is this a scab kernel? Is this a sprout kernel? And so on. So this data is in a common delimited file called wheat. 
Here's a nice plot of the data. This is a parallel coordinates plot. And if you haven't seen one of these before, let me take some time to explain it. So on the x-axis there, you see all the explanatory variables that we have in our data set. And for each of them, you see an, uh, like a, a vertical axis. And what this vertical axis represents is um, how particular kernels, how they are relative to one another for each variable. So for example, the kernel with the smallest density is right down there where you see, at least at my angle, I'm sorry, but where, where a green line is, is, is crossing a vertical axis here. And up here you see a green line crossing the vertical axis and that corresponds to um, uh, the kernel that has the highest density. And all the other lines that are crossing that vertical axis correspond to other kernels. So like a, the median kernel would fall somewhere like in the middle. Now this kind of same idea then is applied to all the other explanatory variables as well. So for example, the kernel with the smallest size is right there. The kernel with the smallest hardness is right there. And then what is done is for the same kernels, lines are drawn to connect the different uh, points of where they cross the axes. So for example, the smallest, the, the, the kernel with the smallest hardness has a relatively small, if you follow the line up, has a relatively small density as well. Okay. Uh, this class.new variable, this corresponds to hard red winter wheat or soft red winter wheat, and I just transform this to a zero or a one. Now, I also here have in the legend information about is the kernel healthy, sprout, or scab? So the green corresponds to scab, the red corresponds to sprout, and the black corresponds to healthy. And what we see here in this plot is that we see like for density, there's a lot of green values towards the bottom, a lot of black values towards the top. So in this initial look of the data, it might make you think, hmm, I see some relationships here. And maybe density is going to help me predict the, uh, the type of wheat kernel. In fact, that's going to happen. Okay, so with my data itself, remember my categorical response is in a variable called type. And I, just to verify that indeed R is recognizing it correctly, I do the class function with it and I get factor. Then the levels of type healthy, scab, sprout. Notice alphabetical order. And so what this means for us is that R is going to treat healthy as one, scab as two, and sprout as three. Then I can use the multinome function to actually estimate the model. This function comes in the NNET for neural networks package of R. This package is automatically installed in R, so you don't have to worry about it, but you do need to say library and any team. Um, and then with multinome, the syntax is very similar to what we saw with GLM. Formula equal, my response is type, tilde, all my explanatory variables here, and my data is in wheat. We get some information printed out. The main thing to realize, ah, it converged. That's good. The results are stored in mod.fit. So if I summarize the information that's stored in mod.fit, I can then figure out what my model is. So in the coefficients table, we see scab and sprout. We don't see healthy because remember, that's the baseline category that we're making our comparisons to. So this 30.55 here is beta hat two zero. The sprout 19.17 value is beta hat 30, the intercepts. The standard errors, these also give me the estimated variances, or the square root of the estimated variances. So here's the square root of the estimated variance of beta hat 30. Then using all these beta hats, I can go ahead and write up my model. Notice there's two lines to the model log of pi hat scab, let's say, that would be category two, divided by pi hat healthy, category one. Log of pi hat sprout, which would be category three, compared to pi hat um, healthy, category one.
Now, let's relate stuff that we did in the last section with a logistic regression model to what we can do here. So, we can do likelihood ratio tests. I can use the capital ANOVA function. And so, I can look at, let's just look at one of these. Density, 90.6. This is my negative 2 log lambda. It has two degrees of freedom because this likelihood ratio test is testing, given all the other variables in the model, it should density be in the model, essentially. And remember, there are two betas representing density in the model, which would be a beta uh, 2, 2 and beta 3, 2. The p-value, using a chi-square 2 distribution, shows it's very small, indicating that, yeah, density is important. And hopefully that makes sense relative to what we saw in that plot. So we saw that, yeah, you know, the, the, the scab ones were kind of low density, the healthy ones were high density. We can also come up with estimated probabilities as well. So if I use the predict function, just like what we did in the last section, we can put pass in mod.fit where I store my results for multi-known. And just to make things easy, let's suppose that we just predict that uh, the values that were observed in our, in our data set, wheat. And what do I want to predict? I want my pi hats. I put that in an object called pi.hat. And I look at the first three observations. So underneath healthy here, we have pi hat 1. The estimated probability that that particular kernel is healthy is 0.8552. Now, one thing I want to point out here, because I anticipate some of you may not have a whole lot of experience with R, is that notice that we were using a lot of the same language that we did in the previous section to get predictions, to get hypothesis tests, or the, the, the statistics for the hypothesis tests. And that's done on purpose, because that's how R is set up. Um, and, and the reason why, though, that using the same language, like summary, like ANOVA, and predict, gives you the correct results despite having a different model, is because R has what are called generic functions and method functions. A generic function is like a function like summary, because it can be used with a variety of different types of objects. So every object has a class, and we've actually already seen class before. But if I did class with mod.fit, notice what it comes back. It tells me, and don't worry about the second thing there, the first thing here, it says multi-known. So this object has a class called multi-known. And so when a generic function is, is, is first applied to mod.fit, the first thing it does, it checks its class. Oh, multi -no. And then it's going to find another function that is specific for that class of an object. So in other words, is if I do the methods function and look at class equal multi -nome, we see a bunch of what are called method functions that can be used or call from a generic function. So when I say summary, just to make sure this is clear, summary mod.fit, R checks what the class is, it sees it's multinome, and then it looks, is there another function that's called summary dot multinome? And it actually executes that function to summarize. With the GLM function, for example, this, if I had a mod.fit, that would have a class of GLM. You don't have to have the same name as the function, but that's the way it's, it's organized. And what it would do is actually, if I did summary mod.fit, it would actually look for, is there a function called summary.glm? And there is. So that's just a little bit of information about how, how R is organized, in case you're really new to R. Um, and you're wondering, why can I use the same function with a different kind of model? OK, let's talk about odds ratios to interpret these explanatory variables. As you might expect, it's not too difficult. Because if we think of it in terms of one explanatory variable, again, to make things easier, we are modeling the log odds of category J versus category 1. So what we can do 
You look at the odds of j relative to 1 at a particular value of x, maybe a density value. And then look at the same odds, but now for a C unit change in x, so that then when we find the ratio of those two odds, as I've done before, things nicely cancel out, and we're left with e to the c times beta j1. That's my odds ratio for x. Again, notice x is not in that expression at all. The only thing you have to worry about is c. So then the interpretation then is the odds of a category J versus a category 1 response change by e to the c times beta J1 times for every c unit increase in x. Of course, if you have other explanatory variables in your model, you have to add something like holding the other variables constant. And you could have odds ratios for more complicated models like what we just saw in the previous section. And it's similar to what we saw with logistic regression. Well, what about inference then? You can do profile likelihood ratio intervals. You can do wall intervals. Unfortunately, the calculations in, or the functions available to us in R um, uh, don't make it as easy as it, as it probably should be. And so there is no easy way to calculate profile likelihood ratio intervals in R. The MC profile package cannot be used. What the confident function does do, though, it calculates walled intervals, which was different from what we saw previously when I was first introducing logistic regression. It would calculate profile likelihood ratio intervals, but in fact, it actually does walled intervals. If you have an odds, and it only does it for simple models, like for where you just have one beta involved. If you have additional betas involved where you have more complicated models, such as a squared term, for example, then you're going to have to go back to deriving what that odds ratio is, and you're going to have to actually program in by hand formulas into R. We do have examples in our programs that demonstrate that. So let's go back to take a look at the weak kernel data set again. And I like to get an odds ratio for every explanatory variable. So in other words, I want e to the c times beta jr for the rth explanatory variable. And we need to choose what c is for every explanatory variable. Now this is an ideal place where you talk to the grain science researchers and you say, hey, what should I use for c? And if that person is still not available, you have to figure out, well, what, what should you use? Or maybe, maybe that person doesn't really have a good sense of what c should be. And so this is one place where you can uh, use kind of a, a, a default value of c, and that is to think about standard deviations. Maybe choose c to be one standard deviation, and that's what we do here. So I need to find the standard deviation for each of these explanatory variables. A quick and simple way to do that is to use the apply function. What I like to be able to do is apply the function r called sd that finds standard deviations to each column of my data set. So I'm going to say apply, and then columns two through six are the ones that are numerical in nature. So apply to the second through the sixth column of wheat. I want to apply the function standard deviation. And by saying margin equal two, that tells our, oh, I want to apply it to column rather than row. Margin equal one would be row. I put that all into an object called sd.wheat. Now, if you remember my first variable here, class, that in, in terms of how the model will re recognize it, it will be either just a one or a zero because it's either hard red winter wheat or soft red winter wheat. So for my C values, I create an object called C.value. It's going to, I'm going to combine a value of one with all my standard deviations. And this is what we get. So for example, with density, one standard deviation is 0.13. Okay. So let's find some confidence intervals. First of all, for beta jr, and then we're going to use the exponential function to help us get it for the odds ratio itself. So I use confident, my object or object equal mod.fit, that's where I store my model fit information, and I want 95% intervals. I put that into object called conf.beta. And what R returns to us is actually the results in a three-dimensional array where the rows correspond to the variables of interest. The columns correspond to, are you the lower limit or the upper limit? And then the strata in this array 
corresponds to, am I doing scab versus healthy? Or if I'm doing sprout versus healthy? Um, so, for example, if we focus on density again, so uh, beta 2, 3, oops, actually 2, 2, excuse me. Yep. It's less than negative 27.7, it's less than negative 15.5. That's my 95% confidence interval for that particular beta. But again, what I want, though, is a confidence interval for the odds ratio. So what I can do is I can put an E here, put an E here, put an E here. And also, unfortunately, I'm running out of room. But if you can imagine, I also am going to multiply by the corresponding C for density, that one standard deviation. Okay, That's my confidence interval. A quick way to do that for every single variable is to go back to conf.beta. My variables are listed in rows 2 through 7. The first row was for the intercept. We don't care about that. The columns, 1 and 2, my lower bound, my upper bound. And then if I want to do scab versus healthy, I need the first strat. So this is a way to extract information from an array. I multiply by C values. R nicely organizes everything and multiplies everything in the correct format. Use the exponential function. And then I print it off after rounding to two decimal places. So for density, my OR is 0.13 to 0 0.03. So notice that the odds ratio is less than 1. Okay, so that says that something's going on with density. That indeed, if you were to increase by one standard deviation density, you know, that, that matters when you compare scab to healthy. And also remember, we're comparing scab versus healthy. So the odds of being healthy are higher than the odds for being scab as the density increases. Well, why does that make sense? Let's go to the plot. Remember, we observed low density ones were healthy, higher density ones, I'm sorry, the low density ones were scab, the higher density ones were healthy. So that's why that, that odds ratio makes sense in that particular setting. Okay, are there any questions? Yes? Let me go back. Yeah, so um, we'll wait. Uh, not, not size, in, in, at least for the scab versus healthy. I don't remember off the top of my head if it was sprout versus healthy was, was significant. But scab uh, versus healthy is, is, is not. Um, so, any other questions? Okay, so um, I think we're, we're right on time. Uh, do note that when I made my original time here, it looks like I forgot to include this last section. So it would take me about 15 minutes, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so what happens if we have an ordinal multi-category multi -category response? Meaning that category one, in some way, is less than category two, which is less in some way category three, and so on. How can we take that into account? Well, this is where we start using cumulative probabilities then. So now I'm going to be interested in directly modeling the probability y is less than or equal to category j. So it's pi 1 plus all the way up to pi sub j. Of course, then, the probability y is less than or equal to category capital J, well, it will be equal to 1, because you only have up to ca capital J categories. Now we can still think of odds, but in terms of these cumulative probabilities. So the odds of y being less than or equal to j would be the probability that y is less than or equal to j divided by the probability that y is greater than j. And with that then, we're kind of like 
what, what we saw with logistic regression. We are working with a log odds again, but now in, in, involving these cumulative probabilities. So the log of uh, the probability of y being less or equal to j divided by the probability y is greater than j. You can rewrite that also as the logit of the probability y is less or equal to j. And we're going to set that equal to a linear combination of betas with the x's. This time, though, we are not going to put a subscript j on the betas, but we are going to do it for the intercept. Okay? There are models out there that will do the subscript j on, on those beta 1 through beta p. And sometimes they're, they're used and sometimes they can work out. One problem, though, that can occur is that you can actually get estimated probabilities that are less than zero or greater than one when you do that, when you have that much freedom. And so typically, you do not uh, allow that, that, that much freedom there. But the intercept, it's okay to work with that beta j zero. And you can see what happens is, and I should mention that these are called proportional odds regression models. And you can see what happens by, with respect to the name that's involved here, proportional odds. Obviously, we're modeling odds. But the proportional part of that name comes into play is that if you rewrite the model so that you have the odds, so now I have e raised to the beta j zero plus beta one times x one plus and so on, I can factor out that beta j zero part and so that the only thing that's going to change on that right hand side is that intercept and actually these beta j zeros will continue to increase as j is increasing and we have this you could say proportionality constant which does not change that's where the name proportional odds comes from now an equivalent way to rewrite this uh, to write this model is so that I just have the probability y is less than or equal to j on the left hand side and on the right hand side you see similar to what we had with the logistic well, regression model but just a different linear combination of the betas and the x's Similar to what we saw with multinomial regression models, you might be wondering, okay, well, I have this weird kind of structure here. Well, what's pi sub j? Well, this, to figure out what this pi sub j is, it comes down to you know, working with probabilities associated with a discrete random variable. So if I want the probability y is equal to j, that's pi sub j, I could rewrite this as the probability y is less than or equal to j, minus the probability y is less than or equal to j minus 1. Because again, I have a discrete random variable here. So when I do that then, I can just simply then plug in what my model is for those two probability statements. And I get my pi sub j for j equal 2 to capital J minus 1. Just not the j equal 1 in capital J case. And it's written in terms of my betas uh, and x's. Well, what about j equal 1? Well, that is corresponds to probability y is equal to 1. So in other words, probability y is less than or equal to 1 minus the probability y is less than or equal to 0. Of course, we cannot have a value of 0. 1 is that lowest category. So that probability is 0. And again, I just take into account how I wrote my model there. And there is pi sub 1. And lastly, what about when you're at category capital J, that lower, the highest category? Then the probability y is equal to j is equal to the probability y is less or equal to capital J minus the probability y is less or equal to capital J minus 1. Well, that probability y is less or equal to j is 1 because you only have capital J categories. So I have a 1 there, and again I take into account my expression and put it down there. So now that I have a way to write out these pi's, I can go form a likelihood function, just like what we saw with multinomial regression, that is a product of a bunch of multinomial distributions, where every place you saw a pi, I put in what my model is. And I need to use numerical iterative methods to estimate these models. 
OK, so now let's go back to using that weak kernel data set. Now, you know, after we got done talking to this grain science researcher, um, you know, we thought, well, you know, maybe one could use a proportional odds regression model here, too. Um, and, you know, is there an ordering amongst the categories? I think all of you will agree with me, the most desirable category is healthy. OK, so maybe we put that as the top category. The least desirable category is scab, because after all, um, it could be poisonous to us. And so, well, what are you left with in the middle? How about sprout? Um, now, I don't know if a grain science researcher would like this order in the categories, but it provides us a convenient way to make comparisons between the proportional odds regression model and the multinomial regression model, which we will do shortly. Now, we need to tell R to take into account this ordering that we have. If you remember from before, when we did levels with the type variable, we had healthy, scab, sprout. That's not the ordering that we have now. We need to change the order. And so the way that we can do that is go back to using that factor function that we saw in section three. And I'm going to work with the type variable. And I just simply write out the ordering that I want with the levels argument. Scab is going to be one. Sprout's going to be two. Healthy is going to be three. I'm going to put this all back into my data set in a new variable called type.order. And now when I use the levels function with it, I get everything in the correct order. To estimate the model, I'm going to use a function called P-O-L-R. It stands for proportional odds logistic regression. This function comes from the mass package, which stands for modern applied uh, statistics with S, I believe. It's an uh, old package, and it's, it's, it's um, automatically installed in, uh, with a default installation of R. And I would still need to, though, say library mass. With the P-O-L-R P -O -L -R function, for my formula, I can put my res response first, tilde, my explanatory variables, my data is in wheat. And then while this is the default, I go, I go ahead and type it out, method equal logistic. We're kind of working with that logistic-like format that we saw before. Put everything into mod.fit.org. And then I summarize the information that's in mod.fit.org. So what we see here in the intercepts, we have our beta hat. This is beta hat 1.0 in beta hat 2.0. Notice how this is written out here. Scab, sprout, sprout, healthy. Because remember what we're uh, modeling. The odds that you're up to category J versus that you've already passed category J. So with respect to scab and sprout, scab is J equal 1, sprout is J equal 2. So the odds at category J or less versus your greater than category, I'm sorry, the odds you're at category one or less versus your greater than category one. So that's why you see that labeled in that way. Now, in the coefficients table here, you have to be very careful because you might think right here where you see density, you might think that this is beta hat um, two. It's not exactly. Oddly, and I don't know why they do this, but the authors of the function actually are estimating this model here. And notice, you have negative signs in front of your parameters. So in fact, beta hat 2 is the negative 13.5. Beta hat 1 is negative 0.17. Beta hat 3 is negative 0.01. So you have to always put a negative out in front kind of awkward. That's the way it's, the package was written. So then, taking the stuff that we just saw on the previous slide, we can then write out the estimated uh, uh, proportional odds regression model. Essentially, we have two separate equations, again, and the reason because that beta hat J0. We can apply likelihood ratio tests, just like what we did with this before, using the ANOVA function. So again, if we focus on density, 
my negative 2 log lambda is 98.4. P-value is very small. We can also get estimated probabilities, or our pi hats, again using the predict function, just like what we did before. So for example, pi hat 3, which now represents healthy, is 0.6895 for the first observation. Let's do a comparison of the multinomial and proportional odds regression models. So what we have here is, suppose I estimate a model with only density in it, just so we can do this comparison graphically. And I estimate both the multinomial model and the proportional odds model. On the x-axis, I have density. On the y-axis, I have the estimated probability of being in the category. And then what I do is I draw the model out for healthy, sprout, and scab, the pi hats where the thin line corresponds to multinomial, the thick line corresponds to proportional odds. And what we can see here is that, generally speaking, these two models, despite one using a, a nominal structure and one using an ordinal structure, uh, are giving us about the same probabilities. So that's kind of interesting. and makes me feel good about doing something that I haven't necessarily talked to the green science researcher about. Lastly, in this section, let's talk about odds ratios. Um, Any intuition? Any intuition? Um, other than the intuition that I gave you, or, or gave everyone at the beginning, about why we would order it in that way. That's, that's my only intuition. So odds ratios, again, we're going to compare two odds. So in this case, though, remember we're working with odds corresponding to um, cumulative probabilities. So let's look at a model with only one explanatory variable, uh, just again to make things easier. We want to know the odds of y being less than or equal to j at a particular value of x, like a particular density value. And I just simply write out what that model would be, e to the beta j0 plus beta 1 times x. Then let's look at a C unit change in X. So here we see the C unit change in X. And you can probably guess what's coming up. I'm going to find the odds ratio. I'm going to take the ratio of those two odds. And look what happens. Again, we have nice simplifications. We have E to the C times beta 1. X is not in there. You've got to be careful about the interpretation because this is a little bit different from what we saw before. So the odds of y less or equal to j, and if you want to, for emphasis, say versus y greater than j, response, change by e to the c times beta 1 times for every c unit increase in x. Now one of the cool things about this expression here is that notice you do not see j. There's no j in there, despite us working with j's throughout. Okay. So because of that then, you can rephrase your interpretation this way. The odds of being below a particular response level change by e to the c times beta 1 times for every c unit increase in x. Where I don't even mention j in my interpretation. Um, of course, you can have other situations where you, know, you have more explanatory variables. You know, add something like holding the other explanatory variables constant. You could have more complicated models, too. And you know you can do similar things to what we saw in section 3 with logistic regression. Um, you can do profile like and ratio intervals. You could do walled intervals as well. Um, what about R, though? Well, confident in this situ for this particular model calculates profile like and ratio intervals. Remember, with multinomial, confident only did walled intervals. Well, here it does profile like and ratio intervals. Fortunately, MC profile can't be used. Confident that default calculates walled intervals. And if you have odds ratios for more complicated models, well, fortunately, you're going to have to program in the by hand formulas. So let's take a look at an example. So, weak kernels data set again. I'm going to look at a C unit change in each explanatory variable. I can calculate 95% profile like and ratio intervals for the odds ratios using, as you would expect, uh, certain techniques. Um, here are my C values once more. 
I apply confint to find confidence intervals for the betas first. There's where I store my information for my model fit, model, mod.fit.org. I went to 95% intervals, put all the results into conf.beta. Then I use the exp function along with all my c values to find confidence intervals for the odds ratios. Be very careful. Notice I have that negative sign there. And that is because of how, again, the P-O-L-R P -O -L function estimates a model. Remember how we had to put negatives in front of what we saw in the summary output? Well, that's what I'm doing here. So then, I have my odds ratios. So there it is for density, 0.11 to 0.26. Similar conclusions to what we had before. Okay. I think that concludes my part you of the... Don't. Okay, see you later. So we're about 15 minutes over where I anticipated, uh, but we had about 25 minutes to play with. Well, I guess that means that my job is to talk very fast. <laughs> time, time to change perspectives. I, I teach and speak differently from Chris, and I also have, uh, I have some, some vocal nodules, so my, my speech therapist has told me that if my voice starts to go, I'm supposed to change the way I speak and I'm supposed to use a throaty voice. So if suddenly I start speaking like this, I'm not being creepy. <laughs> I find it very hard to speak this way and take it seriously, though. <sighs> so I'll try, I'll, I'll try to be gentle and not shout, and let's, let's hope that I don't have to get all creepy on us. Uh, we're going to change, change, uh, change structures now a little bit to something that's fundamentally a little bit different from the counts that you've been studying so far. Uh, all the counts that you've studied so far have been results of a trial that hands you back an answer of one category or another. So for example, in the logistic regression section, um, we were talking about counts of n identical Bernoulli trials. So the field goal kicks, for example. Each kick was attempted, and you got either a success or a failure. In the case of the multinomial, each kernel was tested, and you got either a healthy, a scab, or a sprout. So you had a fixed number of trials, and your counts were going to be numbers that added up to that number of trials. But not all counts arise in that way. Um, in particular, there, there are many times when we observe an event-generating process over a fixed time or space or exposure. And here are just a few examples. The number of cars crossing a bridge in an hour, which is very relevant to people who commute. How many cars are crossing a bridge in, in a given hour? That's something that is not, that there, there's not a fixed upper limit. There's a practical limit to the number of cars you can cram across the bridge in the hour, but there is no number of trials that leads to a number of successes in, in that sense. The number of weeds in a plot of cropland, it's not like you take every, you know, every, every square millimeter and say yes or no, is there a weed there? Yes or no, is there a weed there? Rather, you simply count the weeds. There is no number of trials that led to the count of weeds. Similarly, the number of moles on a person's body, it's just a number that shows up based on the intensity of a process that happens on, on, a, on a human being. It's not, it's not having anything to do with the number of trials. So these counts are different fundamentally from the counts that Chris has been studying and Chris has been, been working with with you. Uh, these counts are free to vary anywhere between zero and no particular limit, whereas the counts that we've studied thus far all are fixed above by some number n. So counts of this type are often modeled using a different distribution, the Poisson distribution. If y has a Poisson random variable, then there's a, there's a formula for the probability mass function. And for our purposes, that formula isn't very important, except to note a couple of things. Number one, there's one parameter in this formula, mu. Mu is the only parameter, unlike, the say, the normal distribution, where there's a mean and a variance parameter. This, this function, this formula, this distribution has only one parameter. And it turns out, and this is very important, it turns out that that parameter represents both the mean and the variance of the distribution. And that has, that has strong relevance for some of the things we'll do later on when we talk about over dispersion. And when I write the model out, I'm going to write y and this little sign here, meaning is distributed as 
Poisson with a mean of mu, and that'll just mean that I have counts that are going to follow that distribution. As was the case with the binomial distribution, we're going to estimate the parameter of Poisson using maximum likelihood techniques, and I won't get into the details other than to say that the methods are exactly the same as they were fundamentally, mathematically, uh, with the binomial and, in fact, with the multinomial. Um, you, you, uh, in, in very, very, very simple cases, like this one where you have only one uh, where you're not doing regression, where you just observe some counts and you have, uh, and you and you're trying to estimate the mean of a single distribution, you, it turns out that the mean mu is simply the sample mean, which is kind of comforting. If you're trying to estimate the mean of a distribution, it's nice that that mean estimate is in fact the sample mean, and it works out that way for the Poisson distribution. However, if you want to calculate a standard error for the mean, rather than calculating a separate variance you actually take the mean again because the mean is the variance of the distribution. So you calculate the mean divided by n is your estimated variance for your, uh, for your parameter. Um, this is a simple problem, so we're not going to cover it explicitly with a, with a program, but there is a program in, uh, in our library for you to look at if you wish called stoplight.r. Um, Okay, the Poisson distribution assumes that the, the true mean count is the same for all observations, which of course is not always going to be true. In a lot of cases, the potential for counts to accumulate changes depending upon circumstances. Like cars crossing a bridge, the mean number of cars crossing the bridge in an hour is going to depend an awful lot on the time of day at which you take that observation. Um, the number of weeds you have in a given plot of land of a given size is going to depend on what else is planted there and whether you apply certain herbicides to, the, to that plot. The number of moles on a person's body will depend on things like their, their age, their race, their, uh, their lifetime exposure to the sun and so forth. So where there are explanatory variables that might influence the mean of a count variable, then we can consider something called Poisson regression. Poisson regression is essentially just like linear regression or, or uh, logistic regression in that we're going to create this notion of a linear predictor. We're going to create this sum of, uh, we've seen this before, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus so forth through beta pxp. But now we're going to model the counts as coming from a Poisson distribution where each different observation has its own potential mean varying in this way. The means are, now I'll get rid of, get, get rid of that business. Uh, the means are relating to uh, the explanatory variables. Now we saw before with logistic regression, we had the logit function. Now we're using an exponential function. And there's one main reason that one uses the exponential function with plus, well, two, two main reasons. One is it turns out that the math is nicer, uh, and, and I know that we don't always like to hear that answer. But the other reason is this one, and this is somewhat important. The exponential, the exponential function guarantees that the means stay positive. You've probably had experiences in your life where you've done a linear regression on a response that has to be a positive value but in some parts of your x space, the linear regression drops below zero, and you're left to try to explain that to someone. Um, this prevents it from happening. And also, because of the fact that we're using maximum likelihood estimation, if that mean were to drop below zero, uh, the estimation would stop. It would blow up. So this keeps the estimation from blowing up. But it does mean that you're assuming some sort of a curved relationship. So if this is x, and this is your mean, you're assuming that your mean is either increasing in an exponential fashion or decreasing in an exponential fashion, which of course may or may not be correct. But again, just like in linear regression, it's an assumption that we make that we can go ahead and check later once we, we begin assessing the, the quality of fit of the model. The inverse of an exponential is the natural log, which we will just write as log. We don't put ln, we're just writing it as log. And it's a log in a linear form. So the linear function is in the log scale for mu. And that, that results in what is often referred to as the log linear model. Uh, oh, Chris found a typo for me. Thank you, Chris. Um, 
<coughs> the interpretation of the parameters in the model, whether you write the model in log form or in exponential form, the interpretation, oh, I'll point out one thing about the exponential form is that if you run the exponential through the sum, it results in a multiplicative looking model like that. Um, that's, that's just running the exponential through the sum and, and you end up seeing that, that the effects of the individual explanatory variables are going to operate on the overall mean in a multiplicative way rather than in an additive way. Um, the general interpretation is just like in a linear regression except because, because this looks just like a linear regression except for the fact that it relates to the log mean instead of the mean itself. So if you want to interpret the parameters, beta zero is just the log mean of y when all of the explanatory variables are set to zero. Or equivalently, you could exponentiate beta zero and that is the mean of y when all the explanatory variables are set to zero. So that's not too difficult an interpretation. And each of the explanatory variables has a coefficient on it, beta j. Beta j is the change in the log mean of, of, uh, of y when xj increases by one unit, holding the other explanatory variables constant. It's exactly the same interpretation as in linear regression, except for the word log. It does, however, have some implications because of the way we can write this multiplicative function there. The exponentiated version of beta j is the multiplicative change in the mean for a one unit increase in xj, which is another way of saying that e to the beta, x, beta j is the ratio of means at xj plus one versus xj. So this model works naturally in terms of ratios rather than in terms of differences. Sometimes that's actually preferable. We often like to express things as ratios because that leads to this possibility, which is a very interesting possibility, of being able to express your changes in terms of percentage changes, which arise naturally from ratios. So you can get the percentage change associated with an explanatory variable for a C unit increase in X by taking 100 times E to the C beta minus 1. As before, the parameters are estimated using maximum likelihood. There's no closed form, so we have to use iterative numerical methods. And the result in estimates that we use the same symbols for, just with hats upon them. And they give us corresponding parameter, uh, par par uh, corresponding variance estimates for the parameters. So all of this is the same sort of thing we've, we've been doing so far. And in, indeed, the inferences are exactly the same as we have done before. So the inferences can be done using walled techniques or likelihood ratio techniques, where both of them require large samples. But walled techniques require much larger samples and, and uh, are easy to compute. Likelihood rate, you can do them by hand if you have enough information. Likelihood ratio, you don't want to do by hand ever. And it gives you a somewhat better result. But after all, this is um, categorical data using R and not categorical data using our fingers. So an example that I have was provided to me by uh, some researchers at Fairleigh Dickinson University. We have some data on 100 moderate to heavy alcohol drinkers. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alcohol consumption. So their definition of moderate to heavy is at least 12 drinks a week for a female and at least 15 drinks a week for a male. So in other words, just like every week at the JSM. Um, uh, I mean, you can just go from mixer to mixer and, and, and knock that one off easily. Um, they recorded, in addition to this, they were trying to see what, what factors influenced these people who clearly were alcohol consumers, what factors influenced them to drink more or less alcohol. And so they recorded various psychological scales relating to life events and also relating to their self-esteem to see, you know, whether people who were, who were generally happy about themselves or people who were generally unhappy about themselves might drink more and whether their alcohol consumption was influenced by the kind of day they had had whether they had good things happen to them that day or bad things happen to them that day. And in particular, they had the hypothesis uh, that, that higher negative life event scores would result in heavier drinking. People drown their sorrows when they've had a bad day. Um, so so these, these individuals maintained a diary of drinks for, for, uh, for each day for a month. 
we have uh, we had we had six days worth of data on these 100 people, and since it was six days worth, and not everyone started on the same day of the week, only 89 of them give us data for their first Saturday. And we wanted to look specifically. We didn't want to mess around with just for the sake of example controlling for days of the week. So we decided we would look at what happened on Saturday and see what negative life events might have influenced their Saturday alcohol consumption. So we have two variables. We have num all, which is the number of drinks consumed on that Saturday, and our x1, the one explanatory variable we'll use in this example, is just an index for the number and of an, an intensity of negative events. So it's called in our model neg event. And it's just an index that's been developed by these, uh, by, uh, by uh, an index of negative life events, I guess. So here we're entering the data in. We have a data set called uh, DeHart Simplified CSV. We're entering the data in, and we are choosing out only those data that have day of the week equal to six, which is the Saturday. And that limits our data set now to 89 observations of four variables, and the four variables I pulled out are the ID for the individual, the number of drinks that they consumed on that Saturday night, for example, nine, seven, somewhat heavy drinkers, I guess, the negative events, and we also pulled out the positive events. Um, actually, that's because in the examples in the book, we do, some, we do some modeling with both of those variables, not just one. Here for this demonstration, I'll just show you how to do the modeling with one variable. Poisson regression is done using our friend, the GLM function. So I don't really need to tell you very much more about it other than here's what needs to change right there. You just need to tell it that the family is no longer binomial, that we're going to use a Poisson family with a log link. And in fact, if you left off the information about the log link, log is the default. So if you were simply to say Poisson and not put anything else after that, it would assume you mean a log link. But I've showed you this to be explicit. Um, and then we get the summary out. And as usual, here's the information that we'll, that we'll focus on for right now. And that information gives us, in particular, our parameter estimates. So we're fitting a model that goes log of mu equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x 1. And these are our parameter estimates. We've got an intercept of 1.52 and a slope in the log sense of minus 0.2612. So summarizing that, our fitted model is that the log mean of number of drinks consumed is 1.52 minus 0.26 times the negative event index. And we can get standard errors out of this. Again, from looking back at, at here, we can get standard errors out of the standard error column. So we can get standard errors for our parameter estimates. Oh, and you know, of course, we get the Wald test coming out of here if we really wish to use it. The marginally significant Wald test p-value of 0 0.055. Um, notice that that's actually in the opposite direction of what the hypothesis was, that, that, that people would increase their consumption when bad things happened. But I don't want to draw any conclusions. I've, I've pulled one variable out of a complex data set for the sake of a demonstration. So, so I don't think we actually are, are doing science here on, on uh, the psychology of drinking. We're just showing you how to use the GLM function to do plus on regression. Um, there are a lot more variables, and a person could play around a lot more and develop much more complicated models for this if one wanted to really try to interpret uh, the effects of the variables on drinking. Just as with binomial, uh, just as with logistic regression, we can very easily get um, uh, means out instead of probabilities. These are means, so we get the predicted uh, the predicted values or the estimated means out simply by 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 say by remembering that we could write mu as the exponentiated um, linear model and then putting hats on everything. So we get our estimated mean out in exactly the same way that you would expect to, just by plugging in the parameter estimates for the parameter values in the in the model. Um, then we can get, as, as I said, this model is good for working with ratios of means. The ratio of the mean at xj plus c against, the, against uh, at xj, holding the other variables constant, is just the, exp 
exponentiated version of C times beta hat J. And if we want to express that as a percentage change, we, it's the same formula that I showed you before. We're just plugging in the estimated value there with the hat. So it's 100 times E to the C beta hat J minus 1. Tests and confidence intervals are done in exactly the same manners as before using likelihood ratio or Wald methods. Uh, with the usual caveats about Wald, the LR inference is available through the MC profile function and the conf int method for GLM does do likelihood ratio, but it does it for individual parameters and not necessarily for C times the individual parameter or for, uh, or for this quantity, the percent change. So looking back at our example, um, suppose we want to find the percent change in, in the number of drinks for a one unit increase in the negative event index. So that's going to be um, uh, 100 times e to the 1 times beta hat 1 minus 1. And e to the 1 times beta hat 1 is just minus 0.26118 e to the minus 0.26118 minus 1. And then, uh, and, and then we, we can plug, uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a formula that does that for us automatically, so we can write that formula out fairly simply and then get the value uh, minus 22.99 for neg event. So that is, there's about a minus 23% change or a 23% decrease in alcohol consumption for each additional unit of the negative event index. Is it 23%? Yeah, that's a 23% change. So that is 77% uh, as much if you increase by one unit. 77% as much drinking. We can get a confidence interval for this by first getting a confidence interval for beta 1 hat and then applying the formula to the endpoints of the confidence interval. So I first get the confidence interval for the neg event parameter using the conf int function, and then I plug that I plug that quantity in to the formula, and I get out the values minus 41.5 to minus 0.3, which tells us that there's somewhere with 95% confidence we believe that there's about a minus 42 to minus 0.3% change for a one unit increase in negative events. Notice that that's, that lower bound or that the upper boundary here is very close to zero, which means there's almost no change, possibly. And you might also remember that our Wald test gave us back uh, a p-value of 0 0.055, which also suggests a borderline indication of a possible change. We can do the likelihood ratio test for significance of the terms using, again, the capital ANOVA function from the car package. Um, so again, I've just loaded up the library and I'm, I'm applying the ANOVA function to the model that I created before and it gives me back the likelihood ratio chi-square test statistic and the p-value. The p-value is 0 0.047, mimicking exactly the confidence interval that I got showing that we just barely have statistical significance at the 0.05 level, um, which differs on the one hand from the Wald test and shows you exactly the dangers of using 0.05 as a boundary. Because depending upon the statistical technique you've chosen to use, you conclude that there either is or is not a significant change in drink consumption due to negative events. Whereas I think it's objectively very easy to see that both of these things are telling you the exact same thing there's marginal evidence of, of this sort of a relationship. What do you think? Okay. It is now exactly 12.30 by my watch, and we're supposed to take uh, an hour and a half break and meet back here at 2. So I will pick up here at 2 o'clock.